the 16th edition of NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations mission is uh, going on down off the coast of Key Largo, Florida as we speak. It'll last about two weeks. The Aquarius Undersea Laboratory is the site of that mission, and we have an entire NASA and international partner crew uh, living and working down there for the two-week time period, practicing what it's like to live and work out into the deepest reaches of space, including asteroids, and one day on to Mars. We are joined now by one of the top side crew members, astronaut Stan Love, a friend to all of us there that uh, is part of the NEMO mission. He is working with the rest of the crew, helping the uh, astronauts and uh, our international partner astronauts down below. So Stan, welcome. Let us know how things are going down there at uh, NEMO 16. Uh, things are growing great down here at NEMO 16. Um, we've been down here for about a week now getting everything ready to send the crew under the sea for their mission. And yesterday their mission began. Um, with a space flight, that would start at crew quarters and the crew would get into a van and drive out to the launch pad and launch into space. Here, it was something pretty similar. The uh, crew left their uh, dormitory room, got onto a boat, and drove out to the habitat, which is about five miles offshore here from Key Largo, Florida, in about 60 feet of water and they splashed down. Now in the Apollo program, splashdown meant the capsule came down and landed in the water. Here at Nemo, splashdown means the crew puts on scuba gear, swims down 60 feet into the habitat, climbs inside. Um, the air pressure inside that habitat is high, high enough to counteract the pressure of the water outside. So there's just a hole in the floor of the habitat with water and they come up through that hole and they're in the dry air of the habitat and they're going to live and work there for 12 days before they return to the surface. Stan, talk about training in the water. Now you did a spacewalk back on STS-122 and obviously, you know, anytime we do spacewalks we practice in the water here in Houston. You know, the water I think sort of is the closest thing we have here on Earth to the environments of space. So talk a little bit about what it's like to train, what are the benefits of it and, and what are, you know, how are they not similar? Well, the water, as you say, is the best simulator we have for doing a spacewalk in, in weightlessness. Um, if you put on your suit, you get underwater, you can hang weights on the suit so that you are neutrally buoyant, which means that if you let go of anything, you, didn't, you neither float toward the surface nor sink toward the bottom. And if you're very good with the way outs, as they are in our neutral buoyancy laboratory, they can even make you... Uh, uh, neutrally or neutral in position, which means that you can put your body into any orientation and you'll stay there rather than uh, immediately riding up with your head up and your feet down. And that's a great analog for space. Um, and that's what they're doing here at Aquarius. Uh, instead of the neutral buoyancy lab pool, which is big, it's not as big as the ocean. So they're in the big pool. Um, we don't have fish in the NBL, so it's kind of fun to watch the spacewalks going on uh, underwater here at Key Largo and see the fish swimming by the camera when you're used to seeing something similar in the neutral buoyancy lab but without the fish. Um, the similarities are too many to list. It really is very, very good training. And without that kind of training, I don't think we would be able to do much in space because the uh, weightless environment and the constrictions of the suit make it very hard to do anything. And sending an unprepared person up there, I think, would be dooming them to failure. Uh, there are a couple of things that aren't the same. Uh, when you come out of the airlock in Aquarius, you have a steel grid deck about three feet below, your, uh, below you, and you swim out into a, you know, blue water with a coral reef below you and fish swimming by. In the neutral buoyancy laboratory, you come out of the mock-up airlock hatch, and you are looking at a cement pool floor about eight feet below you come out of the real airlock in the space station, you've got the Earth going by 220 miles below at 17,000 miles per hour. So that's pretty different. Another thing is that uh, no matter how well they weigh you out in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, your body does tend to have a preferred orientation. And usually that's with your head a little bit up and your feet a little bit down. And if you do nothing, you'll sort of end up in that position. In space, that is not true. You don't have a preferred orientation, and the tiniest touch of anything, touch a handrail, anything on the space station, will not only move your body, but it will start your body rotating. And uh, that is something that we cannot exactly simulate in the NBL, and it's something that all first-time spacewalkers have to contend with. And I certainly spent quite a lot of time and energy contending with it on my first spacewalk. So let's talk about each of the crew members. Uh, 
tell us kind of what they're each doing down there. And you know, do they keep a normal schedule down there, or is it something that sort of mimics what a what a mission would be? They are keeping a, a mission timeline just like we would for a space flight. In fact, it's very much like a space shuttle flight in terms of the duration of the mission. The difference is they are doing a lot more EVA. Every crew member is going outside at least once a day, and they always go out in pairs in case one runs into a problem. Their partner can help them out. So we have a pair of spacewalkers going out in the morning, and then they come back in for lunch, and then the other two people who are inside in the morning go out for a spacewalk in the uh, afternoon. On a shuttle flight, you will have at most one spacewalk per day. Again, we go out in pairs, and we do at most five total spacewalks on an entire uh, 12 or 13 day mission. So these guys are going to be doing, I don't know, 16 EVAs, I guess. They have eight days of EVA and two EVAs per day. Now it's easy in Aquarius because again, all you do is put on your dive suit, which only takes a few minutes, and you drop down into that, what they call the wet porch, that uh, hole in the floor where it's just the ocean water there, and then they swim out and they're, and they're working. Whereas for a space shuttle EVA, it takes much longer to put on the spacesuit. You need help to do it because it's very big and bulky, difficult to get into. There are, there's a couple hours worth of system checks that you have to do to make sure that the suit is working right every time you go outside before you go. And also the crew for a real spacewalk has to pre-breathe oxygen for a while before they get in the suit because when you get outside in that suit, the air pressure in the suit is uh, only about a third of the pressure in uh, the room you're sitting in right now. And if you go from normal pressure to one-third pressure really quickly, you get the bends, which is uh, a risk that divers face, and it's a risk that the habitat crew is getting around because the air pressure they're breathing in the habitat is just the same as the water pressure outside. So they never have to worry about getting bent. Um, now. There's a price they pay for that. You get a lot of efficiency. You can just go into the habitat, come out of the habitat. You don't have to worry about the bends at all. But right now, that crew has been down there for 24 hours, and their tissue, their, their bodies are saturated with nitrogen gas. So if one of them went to the surface, they would certainly uh, get nitrogen gas bubbles coming out of solution in their bodies that uh, can cause incredible pain in the joints. It can give you gas bubbles in your bloodstream, which you don't want. It can cause problems in the lung. It can cause problems in the nervous system. It's very bad news. So their motto here at uh, Aquarius is, the surface is not an option. Much like at Johnson Space Center, we have failure is not an option for the mission control teams. <laughs> so Stan, talk about uh, what you guys are doing up on top side. I mean, there's an entire team of people there, you know, supporting the crew that's down below. So what are you guys uh, doing each day? And, uh, you know, what, are you sort of serving as sort of a pseudo mission control team or, or what is it? We have actually a mobile mission control center, which is a converted semi-trailer, and we can take it anywhere on the continent. Um, the last time I saw it in action, it was at Pavilion Lake, British Columbia, about 3,500 miles from here, uh, almost as far as you can get from Florida and still be in North America. Um, and that trailer is set up exactly like a mission control. There are consoles for different operators, each of whom is in charge of a different system. You'll have someone acting as a flight director, you'll have a Capcom, you'll have a medical officer, and then experts for all the systems, and it is precisely like a mission control center. Now, it's not as big. It doesn't have as many different flight controllers in it as a real control center. Um, and, of course, it's less complicated. The real control center is massively complicated. But uh, we have a real mission running here, and we're treating it as such with a real mission control. Now, that mission control runs about 14 to 15 hours a day, um, a lot of the folks in there are doing that as a single shift, whereas in the real mission control, we try to hand over shifts every eight hours to keep people from getting too tired. Um, then we also have a lot of people here who are not working in mission control, but working other things. Uh, today, we have two little submarine submersibles that are going to be doing uh, marine science uh, for the next four days. And the next four days after that, they're going to be working with us on the asteroid exploration simulation as if they were little tiny spacecraft we had to work alongside our suited astronauts outside. Um, but they're doing reef science, so we've got a bunch of um, marine biologists with us. We also have a, a bunch of folks who are making sure that the systems in the mission control are working properly, and that's true of a real mission control, too. We have a big team that you never see on screen working in the background of that building to make sure the lights stay on and the bathrooms work and the coffee machine is 
properly stocked and to make sure all the electronic communication inside that building works. Setting something like that up on the fly, as we do here in the field, is very complicated, and we have a lot of people to help with that. And then we also have a dedicated team of folks who are paying very close attention to our Aquanauts uh, spacewalks. They have designed and built all of the tools for that themselves. And if anything breaks, which almost always happens on an EVA, things don't go quite right. Um, and also in the saltwater environment, things uh, uh, that normally rotate don't <laughs> and other difficulties. So we've got a whole team of people paying attention to those EVA tools and making sure that everything the crew is going to use is going to work properly. Well, it's going to be important lessons as uh, we look to go on further than we've ever gone before to an asteroid and on to Mars. And Stan, we want to thank you for joining us. I know you guys are busy down there. We're going to be following along. If you would like to follow along with the NASA NEMO mission, they're on Twitter at uh, NASA underscore NEMO. So Stan, thank you so much for joining us. You guys uh, enjoy your time down there in Florida. You're welcome, Josh. It was a pleasure talking to you.